You needn't think I'm crazy, Elliot. Plenty of others have queerer prejudices than this. Why don't you laugh at Oliver's grandfather who won't ride in a motor? If I don't like that damn subway, it's my own business. And we got here more quickly anyhow in the taxi. We'd have had to walk up the hill from Park Street if we had taken the car. I know I'm more nervous than I was when you saw me last year, but... You don't need to hold a clinic over it. There's plenty of reason God knows, and I fancy I'm lucky to be sane at all. Why the third degree? You didn't used to be so inquisitive. Well, if you must hear it, I don't know why you shouldn't. Maybe you ought to anyhow. For you kept me writing like a grieved parent when you heard I had begun to cut the art club and keep away from Pikmin. Now that he's disappeared, I go around the club once in a while, but my nerves aren't what they were. No, I don't know what's become of Pikmin, and I don't like to guess. You might have surmised that I have some inf inside information when I dropped him, and that's why I don't want it to think where he's gone. I'll let the police find what they can. It won't be much. Judging from the fact that they don't know yet of the old North End place he hired under the name of Peters. I'm not sure that I could find it again myself, not that I'd ever try, even in broad daylight. Yes, I do know. Or I'm afraid I know why he maintained it. I'm coming to that. And I think you'll understand before I'm through why I don't tell the police. They would ask me to guide them. But I couldn't go back there even if I knew the way. There was something there. And now I can't use the subway or maybe... You may as well have your laugh at this, too. Go down into cellars anymore. I should think you've known I didn't drop Pikmin for the same silly reasons that fussy old women like Dr. Reed or Joe Minot or Bosworth did. Morbid art doesn't shock me. And when a man has the genius Pikmin has, I feel an honor to know him, no matter what direction his work takes. Boston never had a greater painter than Richard Upton Pikmin. I said it at first, and I say it still. I never swerved an inch either when he showed that quote-unquote ghoul paint feeding. That, you remember, was when Minot cut him. You know, it takes profound art and profound insight into nature to turn out stuff like Pikmin's. Any art magazine cover hack can splash paint over wildly and call it a nightmare or a witch's sabbath or, or a portrait of the devil. 
but only a great painter can make such a thing really scare or ring true. That's because only a real artist knows the actual anatomy of the terrible or physical physiology of fear. The exact sort of lines and proportions that connect up with latent in in instincts or hereditary memories of fright. And the proper color, contrast, and lighting effects to stir the dormant sense of strangeness. I don't have to tell you why Fuseli really brings out the shiver while a cheap ghost story frontispiece piece merely makes us laugh. There's something those fellows catch. Beyond life. That they're able to make us catch for a second. Dory had it. S Simi had it. Angarola of Chicago has it. And Pikmin had it as no man ever had it before, or I hope to heaven ever will again. Don't ask me what it is they see. You know, in ordinary art, there's all the difference in the world between the vital breathing things drawn from nature or models and artificial truck that commercial small fry reel off in a bear studio by roll. Well, I should say that the really weird artist has a kind of vision which makes models or summons up which amounts to actual scenes from the spectral world he lives in. Anyhow, he manages to turn out results that differ from the pretender's mince pie dreams in just about the same way that the life painter's results differ from the concoctions of a correspondence school or cartoonist. If I had ever seen what Pigman saw... But no, here, let's have a drink before we get in deeper. God, I wouldn't be alive if I had ever seen what that man, if he was a man, So. You recall that Pikmin's forte was faces. I don't believe anybody since Goya could put so much of sheer hell into a set of features or a twist of expression. And before Goya, you have to go back to the medieval chaps who did the gargoyles and chimeras on Notre Dame or Mont Saint Michel. They believed all sort of things, but maybe they all saw all sort of things too. For the Middle Ages had some curious phrases, phases. I remember you asking Pikmin yourself once. The year before you went away, when, wherever in Thunder he got such ideas and visions. Wasn't that a nasty laugh he gave you? It was probably because of that laugh that Reed dropped him. Reed, you know, 
had just taken up comparative pathology and was full of pompous, quote-unquote, inside stuff about the biological or evolutionary significance of this or that mental or physical symptom. He said Pikmin repelled him more and more every day, and that almost frightened him toward the last. That the fellow's features and expression were slowly developing in a way he didn't like, in a way he wasn't human. That wasn't human. He had a lot of talk about diet, and that said Pikmin must be abnormal and eccentric to the last degree. I suppose you told Reed if you and he had any correspondence over it that he had let Pikmin's paintings get on his nerves or harrow up his imagination. I know I told him that myself then. But keep in mind that I didn't drop Pikmin for anything like this. It was on the contrary. My admiration for him kept growing for that ghoul feeding was a tremendous achievement. As you know, the club wouldn't exhibit it. And the Museum of Fine Arts wouldn't accept it as a gift. And I can add, nobody would buy it. So Pikmin had it right here in his house. Until he went. Now his father had it in Salem. You know, Pikmin comes of old Salem stock and had a witch ancestor hanged in 1692. I got in the habit of calling on Pikmin quite often, especially after I began making notes for a monograph on weird art. Probably it was his work which put the idea in my head. And anyhow, I found him a mine of data and suggestions when I came to develop it. He showed me all the paintings and drawings he had about, including some pen and ink sketches that, he, that would, I very believe, have gotten kicked out of the club if many of the members had seen them. Before long, I was a pretty nearly a devotee, but and I would listen for hours like a schoolboy to art theories and philosophic speculations wild enough to qualify him for, for the Danvers Asylum. My hero worship, coupled with the fact that the people generally were commencing to have less and less to do with him, made him get very confidential with me. And one evening, he hinted that if I were fairly close-mouthed and none too squeamish, he might show me something rather unusual. Something a bit stronger than anything he had in the house. You know, he said, there are things that won't do for Newberry Street, things that are out of place here, and that can't be conceived anywhere, here anyhow. It's my business to catch the overtones of the soul, and you won't find those in a parvenu set of artificial streets on made land. Back Bay isn't Boston. It isn't anything yet. Because it's had no time to pick up memories and attract local spirits. If there are any ghosts here, there's a tame ghost of a salt marsh and a shallow cove. And I want human ghosts. The ghosts of beings highly organized enough to have looked on hill and know the meaning of what they saw. The place for an artist to live is the north end. If any esthete were sincere, he'd put up with the slums for the sake of mass traditions. God, man, don't you realize that places like that weren't merely made, but actually grew? Generation after generation lived and felt and died there, and in t days when people weren't afraid to live and feel and die. Don't you know that there was a mill on Copps Hill in 1632 and that half the present streets were laid out by 1650? I can show you houses that have stood two centuries and a half or more. Houses that have witnessed what would make a modern house crumble into powder. What do moderns know of life and forces behind it? You call the Salem witchcraft a delusion, but I'll wage my four times great-grandmother could have told you things. They hanged her on Gallows Hill, with Cotton Mather looking sanctimoniously on. Mather, damn him, was afraid somebody might succeed in kicking free of this accursed cage of monotony. I wish somebody laid a spell on him or sucked his blood in the night. I can show you a house he lived in, and I can show you another one that he was afraid to enter in spite of all his fine, bold talk. 
He knew things he didn't dare put in that, that stupid manac magnolia or pure isle wonders of the invisible world. Look here. Do you know the no whole North End was once a whole set of tunnels that kept certain people in touch with other, each other's houses and the burying ground in the sea? Let them prosecute and persecute above ground. Things went on day every day that they couldn't reach, and voices laughed at night that they couldn't place. Why, man, out of every ten surviving houses built before 1700 and not moved since I'll wager and that in eight, I can show you something queer in the cellar. There's hardly a month that you don't read of workmen finding bricked up arches and wells leading nowhere in this or that old place as it comes down. You could see one near Henchman Street from the elevated last year. There were witches and what the spells summoned, pirates and what they brought in from the sea, smugglers, privateers. I tell you, people knew how to live. And how to enlarge the bounds of life in the old times. This wasn't the only world a bold and wise man could know. <laughs> and to know, to think of today in contrast, with such pale pink brains that even a club of supposed artists gets shudders and convulsions if the picture goes beyond the feelings of a Beacon Street tea table. The only saving grace of the present is that it's too damn stupid to question the past very closely. What do maps and records and guidebooks really tell you of the North End? <laughs> bah. And I guess I'll guarantee you that to lead you to 30 or 40 alleyways and networks of alleys north of Prince Street that aren't suspected by 10 living beings outside of the foreigners that swarm them. And what do those dagos know of their meaning? No, Thurber, these ancient places are dreaming gorgeously and overflowing with wonder and terror and escapes from the commonplace. And yet there's not a single living soul, for I had been digging around in the past for nothing. See here, you're interested in this sort of thing. What if I told you that if I got another street up there where I can catch the night spirit of antique horror and pink things that I couldn't even think of in Newberry Street? Naturally, I don't even tell the cursed old maids at the club. With Reed, damn him, whispering even as it is that I'm a sort of monster bound in the toboggan of reverse evolution. Yes, Thurber, I decided long ago that one must paint terror as well as beauty from life, so I did some exploring in places where I had reason to know terror lives. I've got a place that I don't even believe three living Nordic men besides myself have ever seen. It isn't so very far from the elevated as distance goes, but centuries away as the soul goes. I took it because of the queer old brick well in the cellar. One of the sort I told you about. The shack's almost build, tumbling down so that windows are boarded up, but I like that all the better, so I don't want... Since I don't want daylight for what I do, I paint in the cellar where the inspiration is thickest. But I've got other rooms furnished on the ground floor. A Sicilian owns it, and I've hired under the name of Peters. Now, if you're game, I'll take you there tonight. I think you'll enjoy the pictures for what all I've said, and I've let myself go a bit in there. It's no vast tour. I sometimes do it on foot, for I don't want to attract attention with a taxi in such a place. We could take the shuttle at the South Station for Battery Street, and after that, the walk isn't much. Well, Elliot, there wasn't much for me to do after that harangue, but to keep myself from running instead of walking from the first vacant cab we could sight. We changed to the elevator at the South Station, and at about 12 o'clock, we had climbed down the steps at Battery Street and struck along the old waterfront past Constitution Wharf. 
I didn't keep track of the old cross streets, and I can't tell you yet which we, which it was we turned on. Well, I don't. I know it wasn't Greeno Lane. When we did the turn, it was to climb through the deserted length of the oldest and dirtiest alley I'd ever saw in my life. With crumbling looking gables, broken small pane windows, and archaic chimneys that stood out half disintegrated against the moonlit sky. I don't believe there were three houses in sight that hadn't been standing in Cotton Mather's time. Certainly I glimpsed it too with our overhang, but I thought I saw a peaked roof line of almost forgotten pre gambrel type, through, though antiquarians tell us there are none left in Boston. From that alley, which had a dim light, we turned to the left into an equally silent and still narrow alley with no light at all. In a minute made what I think was an obtuse angled bend toward the right in the dark. Not long after this Pickman produced a flashlight revealed an antediluvian ten panel door that looked damnably warm eaten. Unlocking it, he ushered me into a barren hallway with what was once a splendid oak Dark oak paneling, simple of course, but thrillingly suggestive of the times of Andros and Phipps and the witchcraft. He took me to a door on the left, lighted an oil lamp, and told me to make myself at home. Now, Elliot, I'm what the man in the street would call, quote-unquote, fairly hard-boiled. But I'll confess that what I saw in the walls of that room gave me a bad turn. They were his pictures, you know. The ones he couldn't paint or even show in Newbury Street. And he was right when he said that he had, quote-unquote, let himself go. Here. Have another drink. I need one anyhow. There's no use in my trying to tell you what they were like. Because the awful, the blasphemous horror, and the unbelievable loathsomeness and moral fodor came from simple touches quite beyond the power of words to classify. There were none of the exotic type you see in Sydney Sim. For none of the trans-saturian landscapes and lunar fungi that Clark Ashton Smith uses to freeze the blood. The backgrounds are mostly old churchyards, deep woods, cliffs by the sea, brick tunnels, ancient panel rooms, or simple vaults of masonry. Copse Hill's burying ground, which could not be many blocks away from this very house, was a favorite scene. The madness and monstrosity lay in the figures in the foreground, for Pickman's morbid art was preeminently one of demonic portraiture. These figures were seldom completely human, but often approaching humanity in varying degree. Many of the bodies, while roughly bipedal, had a forward slumping and a vague canine cast. The texture of the majority of it was a kind of unpleasant rubber in these. Oh, I can see them now. Their occupations, well, don't ask me to be too precise. They were usually feeding, I won't say on what. They were sometimes shown in groups in cemeteries or underground passages and often appeared to be in battle over the prey, or rather their treasure trove. And what damnable expression, expressiveness Pickman sometimes gave the sightless faces of his charnel booty. Occasionally there were things were shown leaping through open windows at night or squatting on the chest of sleepers, worrying at their throats. One came ashore to ring with them, bayed about a hanging witch on Gallows Hill, whose dead face held a close kinship to theirs. Don't get the idea that it was all a hideous business of the theme 
and setting which struck me faint. I'm not a three-year-old kid, and I'd seen much like this before. It was the faces, Elliot. Those accursed faces that leered and slavered out of the canvas with the very breath of life. By God, man, I very believe they were, we were alive. That nauseous wizard had waked the fires of hell in pigment, and his brush had been a nightmare spawning wand. Give me that decanter, Elliot. There's one thing called the lesson. Heaven pity me that I ever saw it all. Listen, can you fancy a squatting circle of nameless dog-like things? In a churchyard teaching a small child how to feed like themselves? The price of a changeling, I suppose. The old, you know the old myth about the weird people who leave their, their spawn in cradles and in exchange for the human babes they steal? Pikmin was showing what happens to those stolen babes, how they grow up, and I believe he was in a hideous relationship in the faces of human and not human figures. He was in all gradations of mor morbidity between the frankly not human and the degradedly human, establishing a sardonic linkage in evolution. The dog like things were developed from mortals. And no sooner had I wondered what he made of his own young as left with mankind in the forms of changelings than my eye caught a picture of and embodying that very thought. It was that of an ancient Puritan, Puritan interior, a heavy, heavily beamed room with lattice and windows and settle and clumsy 17th century furniture with the family sitting about what their father reads from the scriptures. Every face but... One showed nobility and reverence, but that one reflected the mockery of the pit. It was that of the young man in years, and no doubt belonged to a supposed son of that pious father, but in essence it was the kin of the unclean things. It was their changeling. And in the spirit of supreme irony, Pickman had given features a very perceptible resemblance of his own. By this time, Pikmin had lighted a lamp in an adjoined room and it was politely holding open the door for me, asking me if I would care to see his modern studies. I hadn't been able to give him much of my opinions. I was too speechless with fright and loathing, but I think he fully understood and felt highly complimented. And I want to assure you, Glenn Elliot, Elliot, I am no model, mollycoddle to scream at anything that shows a bit of departure from the usual. I'm middle-aged and decently sophisticated, and I guess you saw enough of me in France to know I'm not easily knocked out. Remember, too, that I just about recovered my win and gotten used to these frightful pictures which turned colonial New England into a kind of annex of hell. Well, in spite of all this, that next room forced a real scream out of me, and I had to clutch at the doorway to keep from keeling over. The other chamber had shown a pack of ghouls and witches overrunning with the world of their forefathers, but this one brought the horror right out of my, their own da my, our own daily life. God, how that man could paint! There was a study called Subway Accident, in which a flock of vile things were clambering up some unknown catacomb through a crack in the floor of the Boylston Street subway and attacking a group of people on the platform. Another showed a dance on Cops Hill of, among the tombs with the background of today. Then there was a number, any number of cellar views with monsters creeping through holes and rifts in the masonry and gritting as they squatted behind barrels or furnaces and waiting near a first victim to descend the stairs. One disgusting canvas seemed to depict a, a vast cross-section of Beacon Hill with ant-like armies of the mephitic monsters squeezing themselves through burrows that honeycomb the ground. Dances in the modern cemeteries were freely pictured, and another conception somehow shocked me more than all the rest. 
have seen in an unknown vault, where scores of the beasts crowded about one who had a well-known Boston guidebook and was evidently reading aloud. All were pointing to a certain passage, and every face seemed so distorted with epileptic and reverberant laughter that I almost thought I heard the fiendish echoes. The title of the picture was Holmes, Lowell, and Longfellow Lie Buried in Mount Auburn. As I gradually steadied myself and I got re readjusted to the second room of deviltry and morbidity, I began to analyze some of the points of my sickening loathing. In the first place, I said to myself, these things repelled because of the utter inhumanity and callous cruelty that they showed in Pickman. The fellow must be a relentless enemy to all mankind and take such glee in the torture and brain and flesh and degradation that mortal attendant. In the second place, they'd terrify because of their very greatness. The art was the art that had convinced them. And we saw the pictures, we saw the demons themselves as, and were afraid of them. And the queer part was that Pickman got none of his power from the use of selectness or bizarre rarity. None was, nothing was blurred, distorted, or conventionalized. Outlines were sharp and lifelike. And details were almost painfully defined. And the face. It was not any mere artist interpretation that we saw. It was pandemonium itself. Crystal clear and stark objectivity. That was it by heaven. The man was not a fan. Fantasticity or romanticity at all. He did not even try to give us the churning, prismatic ephemera of dreams, but coldly and sardonically reflected the some stable me mechanistic and well-established horror world that which he saw fully, brilliantly, squarely, and unfalteringly. God knows what that world can have been, and where he ever glimpsed that blasphemous shapes that loped and trotted and crawled through it. But whatever the baffling source of his images, one thing was plain. Pikmin was in every sense, in conception and in ex execution, a thorough, painstaking, and almost scientific realist. My host was now leading down the way down the cellar to his actual studio, and I braced myself for some hellish effects among the unfinished canvases. As we reached the bottom of the damp stairs, he turned on his flashlight to a corner of the large open space at hand, revealing the large circular brick curb of what was evidently a great well in the earthen floor. We walked nearer, and I saw that it must have been five feet across, with walls a good foot thick and some six inches above the ground level. Solid work of the 17th century where I was much mistaken. That Pickman said what was the kind of thing he had been talking about. An aperture of the network of tunnels that used to undermine the hill. I noticed idly that it did not cover. Think of the things that it must have been well connected with if Pickman's wild hints had been not been mere rhetoric. I shivered slightly. and turned to follow up a, a step and through the narrow door into a room of fair size, provided with the wooden floor and furnished as a studio. An acetylene gas outfit gave that light necessary for work. The unfinished pictures were on easels or propped against walls were as ghastly as the finished ones upstairs and showed the painstaking methods of artists. Scenes were blocked out with extreme care and penciled in guidelines told in minute exactitude which Pickman used in getting the right perspective and proportions. The man was great, I say it even now, 
knowing as much as I do. A large camera on a table excited my notice, and Pickman told me that he used it in taking scenes for backgrounds, so that he might paint them from photographs in the studio instead of carting his outfit around town for this or that view. He thought a photograph quite as good as an actual scene or model for sustained work, and declared that he employed them regularly. There was something very disturbing about the nauseous sketches and half-finished monstrosities that leered about from every room, side of the room when when Pickman suddenly unveiled a huge canvas on the side of the, of the light. I could not for my life keep back a loud scream. The second I had emitted that night, it echoed and echoed through the dim vaultings of that ancient and nitrous cellar, and I had to chuck back a flood of reaction that re threatened to burst out as hysterical laughter. Merciful creator! Elliot, but I do not know how much was real and how much was feverish fancy. It does not seem to me Earth can hold a dream like that. It was a colossal and nameless blasphemy with glaring red eyes, and I, it held in bony claws a thing that had been a man, gnawing at the head as a child nibbles at a stick of candy. Its position was a kind of crouch, and as one looked, one felt that at any moment it might drop its present prey and seek a juicier morsel. But damn it all, it wasn't even the fiendish subject that made it such an immortal fountain the head of all panic. Not that, nor the dog face with the pointed ears, bloodshot eyes, flat nose, and drooling lips. It wasn't the scaly claws, nor the mold-caked body, nor the half-hooked feet. None of these, though any of one of them might have driven an, an excitable man to madness. It was the technique, Elliot. The cursed, imp impious, the unnatural technique. It's I am a living being. I never elsewhere saw the actual breath of life so fused into a canvas. The monster was there. It glared and gnawed and gnawed and glared. And I s knew that only a suspension of nature's laws could ever let a man paint a thing that within a, without a model without some glimpse of the netherworld which, which no mortal unsold of the fiend has ever had. Pinned with a thumbtack to the vacant part of the canvas was a piece of paper now badly curled up, probably. I thought a photograph of which Pickman meant to paint a background as hideous as the nightmare that it was to enhance. I reached out to uncurl and look at it, and was suddenly I saw Pickman start as if shot. He had been listening with peculiar intensity ever since my shock scream and had wakened accust accustomed echoes in the dark cellar, and now he seemed struck with a fright which, though could not compare to my own, had in it more of the physical than of the spiritual. He drew a revolver and motioned me to silence, and then stepped out in the main cellar and closed the door behind him. I think it was I was paralyzed for an instant. Imitating Pickman's listening, I fancied I heard a, a faint scurrying sound somewhere in a series of squeals or bleats in a direction I couldn't determine. I thought of huge rats and shuddered. And then there came a subdued sort of shat, clatter that somehow set me all in goose flesh. A furtive, groping kind of clatter. Though I can't attempt to convey what I mean in words. It was like heavy wood falling on stone or brick. Wood on brick. What did that make me think of? It came louder. Again and louder. There was a vibration as if the wood had fallen farther than it had fallen before. After that followed a sharp grating noise that sh shouted gibberish from Pikmin and the deafening discharge of all six chambers of a revolver, fired spectacularly as the line hammer might fire in the air for effect. A muffled squeal or squawk and a thud, then more wooden brick grating of paws and the opening of a door, at which I confess I have started violently. Pickman reappeared with a smoking weapon, cursed the bloating rats that infected the ancient well. The deuce knows what they eat, Thurber, he grinned, for those archaic tunnels touch graveyard on Witch Den and Seacoast. Whatever it is, 
They must have run short, for they were devilishly anxious to get out. Your yelling stirred them up, I fancy. Better be cautious in these old places, though our warden friends are one drawback, though I sometimes think they're a positive asset by way of atmosphere and color. Well, Elliot, that was the end of the night's adventure. Pikmin had promised to show me the place, and heaven knows he had done it. He led me out of the tangle of alleys in another direction, it seems, for when we sighted a lamppost, we were in half a familiar street with monotonous rows of mingled tenement blocks and old houses. Charter Street, it turned out to be, but I was too flustered to notice just where we hit it. We were too late for the elevated and walked back downtown through Hanover Street. I remember that walk. We switched from Tremont up, up Beacon and Pickman left me at the corner of Joy where I turned off. I never spoke to him again. Why did I drop him? Don't be impatient. We talked to him for coffee. We've had enough of the other stuff, but I, for one, need something. No, it wasn't the paintings I saw in that place. Though I'll swear that they were enough to get him ostracized and nine tenths of the house, the homes, and clubs of Boston. And I guess you won't wonder now why I have to steer clear of subways and sewers. It was something I found in my coat the next morning. You know, the curled up paper tackled to the frightful canvas in the cellar. The thing I thought it was a photograph of something seen. He meant to use as a background for that monster. That last scare had come while I was reaching to uncur uncurl it. And it seems that I had vacantly crumbled it up in my pocket. But here's the coffee. Take it black, Elliot, if you're wise. Yes, that paper was the reason I dropped Pickman. Richard Upton Pickman, the greatest artist I've ever known and the foulest beast that ever leapt the bounds of life into the pits of myth and madness, Elliot. Old Reed was right. He wasn't strictly human. Either he was born in strange shadow or had found a way to unlock the forbidden gate. It's all the same now. For he's gone. Back in the fabulous darkness he loved to haunt. Here, let's have the chandelier going. Don't ask me to explain or even conjecture about what I've learned. Don't ask me either about what lay behind that mole-like Scrambling Pikmin was so clean to pass off as rats. There are secrets, you know, which might have come down from old Salem times. And Cotton Mather tells even stranger things. You know how damned lifelike Pikmin's paintings were? How we were all wondered where he got those faces. Well, that paper wasn't a photograph of any background at all, after all. What it showed was simply the monstrous being he was painting on that awful canvas. It was the model he was using. It was the background he was, was merely... The wall of the cellar studio in minute detail. But by God, Elliot... It was a photograph of her life.